Good morning, guys. Today is July 3rd. Today is Wednesday. Hope everybody's well. It's about nine o'clock here, Pacific time. One of the companies that showed up in the radar was Guidewire Software. Now, I was taking a break for about a couple of weeks trying to figure out which is the best way going forward for me to be able to provide updates on video. Now that we've crossed over 25,000 viewers on YouTube, it's actually starting to make more money for me from uh, this than the X platform or Twitter is. So I just am going to continue to provide two to three updates a week. I hope you guys look through it and let me know what you think. All right. One of the companies that showed up on the radar is Guidewire Software. Now, Guidewire is a vertical SaaS solution. What that means is, uh, as you will see, a lot of software companies, software as a service companies, tend to be very horizontal in nature, CRM software, application software, for example, such as HubSpot uh, on the marketing side, Salesforce on the Salesforce side, Adobe on the marketing side as well. Now, vertical software actually focuses on a specific industry. So in one of the companies that we covered before was Appfolio, A-P-P-F. Uh, you can search on my profile for that company. Now, they focus primarily on helping real estate companies, mostly uh, real estate, um, large rental institutions, to be able to manage their rental properties better. Similar to that, in the property and casualty insurance space, Guidewire Software is one of the vertical SaaS companies. So we're going to take a look at what is Guidewire Software, what they do, how they do it, how well they perform, and some of the things that make them interesting different. With the key point of the question going forward from here, I'm going to focus on can this company double from where they are? And how long will it take to do that? So Guidewire is roughly about $11 billion software company doing about a billion dollars in revenue. So to double in market cap, they should technically even double in their revenue and in their profit. Even if they double their profit or do better than profit, even with a slower growth in their top line, that would also be really good. So let's take a look at that to try and answer the question, can they double from here? We're going to go through our initial overview of the company, what they do, the market, et cetera, then go into the technical analysis and the fundamental analysis. Okay. <clears throat> There are roughly about 2,000 insurers worldwide. Now, these are companies such as MetLife, such as Geico, such as Progressive Insurance. These companies are broken into three different types of tiers. The top ones do over $5 billion. The mid-tier ones do about $1 billion to about $5 billion in direct written premium. And then the lower tier ones, three, four, and five, do less than a billion dollars in premium. There are roughly about 80 of them that are top tier, tier one, and roughly about 200 of them in tier two. And tier three has about literally about 2,000 of them, rough, these are rough numbers. So you look at it overall, the biggest number of property and casualty insurers are in the Americas, roughly about 45%. Uh, Europe and APAC are similar in size with about 20 something percent. And in the tier one, a large concentration of tier one in terms of the direct written premium is concentrated around the tier one insurers themselves. So 80 of the insurers control nearly about 49% of the market Overall, 2.7 trillion is the total amount of money that is spent in terms of insurance, the current written direct written premium in terms of insurance. So this goes all the way from companies such as Lemonade to AIG, as you know. And the market is also split into personal lines and commercial lines. Personal lines are for individuals, boat, home, etc. Life insurance, not property and casualty, but life insurance is one of them. And then commercial lines are for businesses. Now, of these 2.7 trillion in direct written premium, roughly about 51% is on personal lines. So property and casualty includes these most important areas. So it's uh, automotive, residential, it includes, includes work, watercraft, mortgage insurance, of course, to a certain extent, recreational vehicle insurance, and all of these. It doesn't include life insurance, as you can see in this one, right? These are what they call personal lines and casualty associated with in accidents and things of that nature. Whereas on the commercial lines, it includes all of these different areas. Uh, ocean and marine, environmental insurance, workers' compensation insurance, etc. So that's about 49%. Commercial lines is about 49%. Personal lines is about 51% of the total. Now, the average insurance company 
PIP day typically tends to have a very complicated set of systems and a lot of integrations between these systems. It starts typically with being able to build the infrastructure and build legacy systems that they use for claims processing and for internal integrations. The core insurance suite essentially is the ability to be able to, number one, make sure that you underwrite the insurance, assess the risk, and then give the direct amount of premium. Each insurance product essentially is a unique product because your insurance will change even from your wife insurance, even if you're in the same company, they tend to be very, very different. And even your insurance for your home will be different from your neighbor's insurance, even if you're in the same location. So premiums tend to be very dramatically different. Each insurance is a unique product. That is the first system, which is the insurance system. You underwrite the process, you underwrite the systems, you underwrite the risk to be able to assess, to build a product on the fly. Then you have the claim system. As soon as someone has a property damage or any other damage of some kind, they will actually manage through the claims process. The contact system is for managing all of your community communications with the systems. And then all of the direct access and the downstream systems are managing your risk, investing the risk, investing in the money that is provided by the premium so you can pay out in the direct amount of time. So if you look at it overall, the most important elements are the policy management, which is how the users come in. They pick the policy that they want to be able to bill. Then they actually pay and manage their billing. The claim center for managing all of their claims and the insurance now product, which is making sure that you can get temporary insurance on an as needed basis. Uh, now, what is useful for a lot of people is also both the on the analytics applications. These are primarily for the insurers themselves. These are more customer facing, these are internal facing, to be able to predict what happens with certain insurance locations, to be able to predict based on different needs and the customers that they do. So what Guidewire does is provide a marketplace of applications and also partner applications on top of their systems that allows them to be able to manage and build the core product, to integrate with various different systems, manage rules that allow you to be able to underwrite better, manage your workflow and the process, rating of the insurance itself, the data and the digital communication. So that's the platform. On top of this platform, they provide a suite of applications that help you manage the insurance process overall, both analytics applications, which are internal facing and customer applications, which are business facing. Okay, now when you look at the entire process from defining the product to selling the product, to underwriting the risk, to managing the policy, and then managing claims. Those are the five most important steps. Look at that, that that's what the process looks like overall. So if you look at that specific products, making sure you have the right set of products available, sold through the right channels, whether it's direct through your website or it is sold through insurance agents with a side set of risks for underwriting, managing it very efficiently for adjusting the claims and the policy, and then making sure you have very good customer service because that's essentially what allows and allows the end customer to be very happy with now, Guidewire Insurance has grown dramatically. They're doing roughly about, they're going to do this year, 2024 estimate is 852. They're probably going to end up a little bit over 900. So the company did go through a little bit of a challenge in the middle, but now it's back on a growth trajectory that is very, very good. The growth trajectory had dropped to single digits, low single digits in the 2021, 22 timeframe. Now it's back on the double digit timeframe. That's one transition. The second transition is going from on-premises software. This company has been around for a while. They're going from more of an on-premises software to a um, subscription model on the cloud. If you remember, this was the same transition Adobe took a while for, Splunk took a while for, a lot of other companies did that same kind of migration. So now they've gotten to the point where they've got a little over 100 insurance suite cloud, insurance cloud customers, very similar to, as you remember, Adobe has creative cloud, marketing cloud, et cetera. They have insurance cloud. The ability to be able to have customers from 2017, they've grown about 100 times, to about 100 different customers and revenue has been consistently growing. Roughly about 540 of the 2000 insurers worldwide are using Guidewire solutions. They're available in about 40 different countries. Uh, they have about 20,000 system integration consultants who are trained on the platform through their partnerships. They're direct written premium. Remember 2.7 trillion is the total, 600 billion is the direct written premium that goes through just Guidewire itself. So that's roughly in the range of, of a little more or a little less than about a quarter, about 21, 20% or something, a little over 20%, and lots of solution partners to be able to help implement that. So they still have a lot of room to grow. To double that, the insurance premiums would go 
direct return premium should go to about 1.2 trillion, which is roughly about half of the market. That's a little bit tight. So I do expect them to double from where they are right now, but more important, I think their profitability should probably start to improve a lot better, which will get their stock price to get to that point. Insurance premiums themselves are not going to be driving their usage. It's going to be more driven by their efficiencies that they create. So they have a lot of existing customers whom they are trying to migrate new products and new services, which is upsell them. And they're trying to get new customers from the 600 customers, 540 customers. They have about 2,000 as a total target to increase the total amount of direct written premium. So they're making a lot of investments in their R&D. They're syndicating both their data for analytics platform and shared analytics solutions. And they're also providing marketplace third-party applications for implementation. So roughly about $9 billion, uh, about a billion dollars right now comes, oops, let's go back. About a billion dollars comes from their current current customers themselves. They're expanding, they believe that they can expand that to probably about $3 billion and then increase the next customer wins, new customers to about 11 billion. So they believe they can get to about their current full rec annual recurring revenue, full year annual recurring revenue, that's F-R-A-R. Okay. They can get to about 3 billion <clears throat> and they can get to about 11 billion is their belief. To get there, they're growing at about 10%. You're looking at about seven to 10 years to get there. So that's a long time to double your money. This is going to be a slow growth company unclose, unless they improve their profitability much better. So the core uh, direct, direct value premium, underwritten premium, they are roughly doing about 1.2 trillion is where they will have to get to just within Americas. They have good penetration here. The opportunity for the cloud is more in Europe and in Asia Pacific. So what are their going things that they want to be able to do grow in the next few years to be able to grow the business? Win new deals, that's one important vector or the area that they can improve on to be able to get more customers. Accelerate migrating from people who are on-premises software to cloud. That also creates new revenue streams in a subscription format. They expand their portfolio by both existing customers and win more of the global 25, top 25. They have roughly about 19, no, 14 of the top 25 global uh, property and casualty insurance is using their software. Uh, international growth is a big advantage for them and then grow the analytics business, which provides a revenue stream as well. The analytics application essentially is taking the data that Guidewire has from a lot of different premium providers and being able to create an aggregate profile of population insurance. It gives them, this gives insurers the ability to say, okay, should I insure in this area of what premium? Is Florida a lot more susceptible to hazards that may be, it may be telling me that the premiums paid there are much higher? Uh, they can go more for comparison of prices in specific areas, makes it a lot more easier to be able to give population level data that enriches the underwriting process itself. The insurers can make much smarter decisions on what kind of insurance to offer where. So net new fully ramped uh, average annual recurring revenue. They're growing at about, they intend to grow at about 35% new fully ramped ARR. Now remember, this is not total revenue. This is just annual recurring revenue. They're growing the annual recurring revenue fast, but overall revenue is growing in only about single, high single digits to low, very low, 10% or so double digits. Um, that's their activity to grow. That's where they want to be able to grow. Um, so what their key driving parameters are, they have a platform that they've built. On top of it, you can build their own applications or partner applications to their marketplace, and then use the analytics applications to be able to drive more movement. Now, overall, about 101 customers they can target in about 10 different regions. This is all their cloud software alone. So out of the 400, 500 out customers that they have, nearly about 100 and then 101 of them are just cloud-based customers as opposed to on-premises customers. So what are they looking to be able to add more? The basic application of Guidewire allows you to be able to buy applications. How do they price? The core set of platform services, you pay a certain amount of money. Then each of these applications, you will pay more depending on the number of policies, number of insurance policies that are under your management. So that's their consumption pricing model to a certain extent, if you will. It's not pride by number of users, but number of policies that are managed under your pricing. And also each of the capabilities required is different. For example, if you look at it overall in the claims processing, they actually price by the number of claims processed through the systems. One of the things that every one of the SaaS companies is doing is trying to figure out how generative AI changes the landscape to a large extent. And they are also trying to be able to build workflow and processes that make it a lot more easier for their customers to be able to do the entire process of underwriting and insurance claim processing a lot easier. Roughly about 40 customer partners, as I said, uh, about 25,000 trained resources almost in various different locations to be able to build, implement, manage, configure, and deploy 
Guidewire software. So they've gone from roughly about $600 million in annual recurring revenue to a little over $1 billion in 2025. That's their goal, about a $1 billion. Uh, the cloud revenue of that is about 70% of that. 70% uh, is going to be just cloud, which is recurring revenue basis. Uh, total revenue of about a billion dollars or so. Uh, gross margin is in the 65% range. They should get that much higher, but 65 is a decent amount of margin. Gross margin about 63, 65% range. Operating margin about 14% and cash flow margin about 17%. So right now they're still not making a ton of money. Uh, if you look at it over here, the minus the SBC. So SBC is a big part of the problem, uh, which is stock-based compensation. Because of stock-based compensation, they have negative grab margin. But if you take stock-based compensation out, they're pretty decently in terms of look at the operating cash flow margin. They're not bad. Okay, so they've gone from roughly about $340 billion in 2017 to about a billion dollars expected in the 2025 timeframe. Not very fast growing company, decent, but not very fast growing. 3X growth in about close to eight, nine years. Um, okay, long-term margin potential roughly in the 75% range is what they're targeting, which is in the 1.5 billion. This is in the 2030 timeframe. 2025, they believe they'll get to what a billion. 2030, they'll get to 1.5 billion is their growth. So 50% growth in the next three to five years, still about 10 to 15% growth. Not great, but it's good. That's Guidewire software, just as an overview. Now let's go into seeing what they actually do from a technical and from a fundamentals perspective. Okay, this is GWRE Guidewire software. We first go into the financials. The fundamentals is where we start. Annualize fundamentals, income statement. Okay, so they're growing at about $500 billion, $500 million in 2017. So they grew higher, 28%. That was good growth. And then after that, they just absolutely completely tanked. Look at this. This is literally flat growth during COVID timeframe. That's bad. Well, remember during COVID, a lot of people gave up their driver's insurance. Biggest part of uh, driving cars, driving motorbikes, driving uh, recreational vehicles such as boats were the big insurance. So this dropped dramatically, increased back again to the single digits. Now they need to get this to the 15, 16%. That would be good, but this is really, really bad. 50%, uh, 60% gross margins. No, about 49. So this is about 50% gross. I mean, the 50% range gross margins. Operating income, they don't really have any. Pre-tax income doesn't exist. So a lot of SBC and net income is also very poor. Uh, on a quarterly basis, are they getting better? Yeah, see, look at that. That's why they're doing so well as a stock. What used to be single digit growth has now gone into double digit and the mid double digit growth. That's a good sign. 15 to 20% growth on a quarter over quarter basis, on a year over year basis. And look at this. This is the best part. Growth profit is improving a lot better than before. Operating income has dropped, uh, a negative dropped very, very well as well. So they're getting to a profitability standpoint. That's a very good sign. So I like this overall. Uh, balance sheet, they've got about $2 billion in total assets, about a billion dollars in current assets and total debt about very manageable debt. I don't think that's a challenge at all for them. Uh, cash flow, yeah, they're prof they have enough cash flow to be able to support their operations. So small amount of debt, not a lot of debt. Okay, so for a company growing 15% year over year in the last quarter, but annualized growth is about 10%. They're asking for a valuation of about 11, which is a little bit rich, not great. You'd like it to be closer to the eight range. That's the historical. Remember, MDB and companies like those, they're getting 30 times valuation for a company going at 25, 30% range. So this is a little bit high. You want to be closer to the eight, 10 range. Uh, 12 is high. This is not 11, by the way, it's really 12. 60% gross margins, negative 2% net margins, primarily driven by stock-based compensation. On a scale of one to 10, if you look at this fundamentals, I'm going to give this a six or a seven. So that's the important part. Now let's go through the uh, technical analysis. This is the monthly chart. We always started the monthly chart. On the monthly basis, this is definitely a stage two markup. So just for context again, stage one is consolidation phase. Look at this. This is a stage one consolidation phase, stage two markup. Then the stage three, then a stage four decline, stage two markup, consolidation phase stage three, then breakdown stage four, did a little bit of a consolidation. And then since then has been a very strong consolidated, strong markup phase. Now it has good support over here in the 129 range, maybe a little bit more than that as well, 130 range, but that's good support for it. Uh, even though it seems to be topping off on the monthly chart. So that's a little bit of a worry. On the monthly chart though, 
the first trend is still going up and to the right. Um, so it's broken through a key barrier, which I think was in this zone 134. So 134 was a key. So that should be the first support, but realistically the first support for it is gonna be in the 130 range, uh, even if it does consolidate a little bit. Okay, what does it look like on the weekly chart? The weekly chart, it's broken through an all-time high and hitting even more all-time highs. That's a good sign. So it's up and to the right, no specific pattern here to really hang your hat on, but still continuing the trend. Okay, so this is a good sign. This is a markup after the earnings. So this was the earnings. This is the gap up after earnings. Look at that. Let me just show you that. The gap up after earnings, and even on the daily chart, it is on a good trend. Not really on an uptrend. So the daily chart, I'm going to say... You look at that, I'm gonna draw it this way. It's slightly to the up and then slightly to, it's almost got a flag. I would say almost a pennant flag type of a situation. Yeah, almost a pennant flag type of situation. Good sign, this is actually a good sign. I can see it getting down a little bit and then rallying up again. Um, the RSI seems to be indicating flatness. So it wants to it wants to top. It's This is not going to rally all the way up. It's going to consolidate here, I think, in the 130 zone, 130 to 139 zone with good support in the 134. I wouldn't mind seeing it going a little bit more down to the 130 area and then rally back up again, given that 15% growth on the last quarter, most recent quarter. Next earnings are expected in... Okay, September 4th. So that's quite a way towards earnings. This is going up before earnings, guys. Uh, the MACD and the RSI seem to be indicating a little bit of consolidation in this. So watch this space very carefully. The near time support seems to be even for it in the 136 zone. I wouldn't be surprised if it tries to hit 136, see a little bit of a move down to 136 and a bounce back up again, because this wants to go higher. Uh, let me know what you think. Thank you for watching it. And thank you for uh, telling me to come back and, and provide these updates to you.